echo what Sarah said. I hope that uh, the powerful worship helped you wake up this morning. But I did happen to notice that when she was up here, she had sandals on. And I'm like, I don't know if it's that warm yet, but I do know that Jesus wore sandals. And so that's no problem if she wants to wear those. But we're really excited that you're here this morning. I want to uh, just highlight a couple of quick announcements before we get into the series this morning. First of all, and this is important, I want to share it with you because some of you are going to see this hit the, the Facebook sometime this week, and so I have to share it with you in advance. But Good Friday service is going to be here this year, and we're partnering with Faith Church. It's going to be an awesome opportunity for us to be together. Pastor Brian Schley from Faith is going to be preaching, and then we're going to have a mixed worship band. Uh, Kyle and Trent are going to be working together, and I'm going to have an important role like welcoming people or something. So... I'm really excited, though, for us to be able to worship together. That's going to be Good Friday, and if you know when Easter is, just back it up three days. That's, that's when Good Friday is. It's going to be at 6 p.m., and we're really excited about that. You're going to learn more details as we get closer to that. The other announcement is just uh, kind of an update on where we're at with the speaker situation. We had an opportunity, as you know, to, to upgrade the sound system, which was very much needed. But one of the things that we as a staff, as an elder board finance team, one of the things that we said along the way was we're not going to go into debt in order to make an upgrade. That was just something that we didn't want to do and we weren't willing to do, even though we, we had things that needed to be updated. So we shared with you as a church the, the desire for us to uh, make the updates and, and we asked that you'd partner with us in that. And I want to tell you, not only did you guys overwhelmingly respond but as a result, we are able to, to get these speakers off the stands and mounted. But we just need a little bit more patience in that process. Uh, we are working with a contractor in order to get those up. And our goal is to have those up by Easter. So some of you are like, when are we going to get those speakers off the stands? It's happening. It just doesn't happen in a, in a week. So we are so excited, though, about what God has done in continuing to elevate the level of just generosity here at Hope Church. And one of the things that we believe is that people didn't just give in order for us to upgrade the sound system. People gave because they know that God is doing a work here, and they're saying, God, I want to give above and beyond because I believe in what you're doing. And so we know that those gifts were in faith. We believe that with you. And we're excited to see what God continues to do through this church and the life of the ministry that involves every single one of you. We aren't here without you. So we're excited about what God is continuing to do. Let me take a moment and pray with us, and then we're going to get started in the message this morning. Father, we, we trust that you are doing a work in us. We know you're doing a work through us. And we're asking this morning that you'd help us to yield to you, to give you the access to our hearts that you desire, and that as we leave today, we would know that we've spent time with you. And this is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this morning I went with a really simple title, Live for Jesus. Live for Jesus. Not earth shattering. I mean, really, as we come together and we gather in a worship service, it's like, well, of course, that makes sense. We should live for Jesus. But one of the things that we also experience in the real world, you know, outside of church on a Sunday morning, is that living for Jesus can be very difficult at times. We find ourselves in, in complex situations or maybe we're around friends or coworkers or people at school where all of a sudden living for Jesus is really tested. In church on a Sunday morning, it's pretty easy for us to make those decisions to live for him. But all of a sudden, when we encounter opposition, whether it be somebody who maybe is picking on you or whether it be somebody who's questioning your faith or your authenticity, living for Jesus can become difficult at times. And, and I know that we've experienced that. One of the things that we've been seeing as we study the early church, the, the believers here, is we see that their commitment to live for Jesus first and most importantly has impacted their lives. Because they have chosen to live for Jesus, it has changed their focus, really the trajectory of their life. And as they live for Jesus, it's caused other people, as we've, as we've been learning, other people to notice that God is alive, that he's doing a work. And as a result, more people have come to faith in Jesus because people have made that individual decision. But what we're seeing is that when we make a decision to follow Jesus, 
it always has an impact on others. More specifically, as we've studied the book of Acts together, we've already come across where because of the early church, their, their belief in Jesus, it's caused them to be brought together, to be united. That's what God wants for us, right? As we pursue him, that we would be brought together. We see in Acts chapter 2 that as a result of their faith in Christ and care for other people, that they sold possessions and that they were able to give to people who had need because there was a generosity that was being inspired. Two weeks ago, Bo, our, our youth director, did an awesome job teaching about the lame beggar who was healed. And what we saw in Acts chapter 3 is that because God is active, because God is at work, he, he healed the man who sat at a gate for 40 years. By the way, if you missed that message or any message in the book of Acts or any of the previous ones, they are available online. And I'd encourage you to go back and to listen to those or to watch them if you haven't. But we saw that God healed a man. As a result, there was religious opposition, and it involved some persecution. So Peter and John end up in front of the Sanhedrin, and as a result, they're being questioned about their faith in Jesus, and it involved persecution. But my point is simply this. When we choose to live for Jesus, when we choose to live for him, that comes with the cost of, surrendered our, of surrendering our lives. Following Jesus and living for him comes with a cost. What I can also tell you is this. Choosing not to follow Jesus also comes with a cost. There's the cost of where a person spends their, their eternity for sure. But even in this world, even in this life, when we choose not to live for Jesus, there's the cost of emptiness. There's this uh, hope in, in, in tomorrow that things would be better, but without Jesus, it's not. There's this passion to pursue things that will hopefully bring some type of fulfillment, and at the end, it's met with nothing. You see, following Jesus comes with a cost, but not following him also comes with a cost that I would say far exceeds the cost of following Jesus. But living for Jesus requires of us to surrender to him. In fact, that's my first point this morning. Surrender has a price. Now, if you're like me, the first thing that you think of when you think of surrender has a price, you, you might think, what is that going to cost me? But before we consider ourselves, let's think about this. Surrender did not start with us. The greatest price that was paid for us did not begin with us. It actually began with God. You see, for Jesus to live a life totally surrendered to God, Jesus allowed himself to be the perfect sinless sacrifice. He would regularly pray, Father, it's not my will, but it's yours. So Jesus was fully surrendered and submitted to God, and as a result, he paid the price for us. So when we consider the, the surrendering that God calls for us to live with, there is a price, but we didn't pay it first. It was God. It was God who showed that it was his love which allowed his life to be in place of our life. It's, it's his will for our will. And as we pick up this morning, we're going to be in Acts chapter 4, looking at verse 23. And here's what it says. When they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and elders had said to them. So real quick, just a reminder. When they were released, it's Peter and John. Again, they stood in front of the, the Sanhedrin, the religious leadership of that day. And they stood in front of that group of people, and, and that group of people were the same people that just some 40, 50, 60 days later, or earlier rather, had sentenced Jesus Christ to die. And as they stood in front of, of that religious group, that religious group said to them, you cannot talk about Jesus anymore. That's enough. And their simple response was this. Whether we should talk about Jesus or whether we should talk about God, whether we should obey you, whether we should obey God, that's up to you. But for us, we're choosing to obey God. Our, our decision is to obey God. And so now Peter and, and John go back to their friends and they tell them everything that's happened. They tell them how they've been wronged. They tell them how they've been maligned and, and, and accused falsely of doing something wrong. Now, we didn't read the rest of it yet. And it makes me think how this story really could have gone one of two different ways. If you didn't read it yet this week, you may not be familiar with what's going to happen. 
But as Peter and John gather with their friends, their friends have really two choices. Their, their friends could talk to them about how God was uh, not there for them. How could God, a good God, allow that to happen in their lives? Their friends could talk about how God has failed them or even betrayed them to allow that to happen to them. Or their friends could look to the situation and say, where is God at work? We know that God is faithful. We know he's in control. We're going to trust him. Now, now I know what happens in the story, but really that's a, that's a spot that we find ourselves in at sometimes. Sometimes when, when we feel like we've been harmed or, or maligned or, or misrepresented, sometimes we go to our friends and we, and we share that with them. But the Bible is very clear in 1 Corinthians 15, that we need to be very careful who, who we keep company with. And this is why. Because the company that we keep can have the, the, I'll say, the influence to determine the trajectory of our thoughts. It's so important that when we're sharing our, our heart with people, that they steer us back to where God is. It doesn't mean that they don't sit with you in pain. It doesn't mean that they don't listen. But what it does mean is that your friends, if they're good friends, they should lead you back to God. Of course, that's what happens within this story. But I want to say one more thing. Over the years, I've experienced that. Not just where people share things with me, but I've experienced uh, situations where I'm like, God, I, I don't see where you're at work in this. God, maybe I'm, I'm missing it. God, this doesn't make sense. God, if this is your will, why is it so painful? Most of us have experienced situations like that. But where I'm going with that is having good friends is pivotal. Having good friends is so critical in, again, the trajectory of our walk. And so here's my point. Peter and John's friends focus on what they can control, not on what they can't control. You see, by focusing on what they can control, they focus on their attitude. They focus on their perspective. And as a result, it's going to lead them to, to worshiping God. But before we get there, let me just remind you, that when we live for Jesus, when we live for him, the title, we are surrendered to him. Plain and simple, it means it's not our will, it's, it's his will. It's not what we want, it's what he wants. In fact, that would be a, a great series to teach, maybe like the first two Sundays in, in June, maybe about the Lord's Prayer. That's a little foreshadowing of what's to come, but here's my point. When we live for Jesus, we allow ourselves to experience trouble. And so here's the test this morning. How do you respond when you experience hard times? Does God have the license in your life to allow you to experience trouble? Does he have the license to do that? Because a part of walking with Jesus in surrender means that we allow him, we allow him the opportunity to allow trouble within us or for us to experience. You see, as we follow Jesus, God is going to allow our faith to be tested. God will allow our faith to be tested, and he should. In verse 23, the story, or verse 24, rather, the story picks up, and here's what it says. And when they had heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made heaven and, and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said, by the Holy Spirit. Here's Psalm 2, verses 1 and 2. It says, Why did the Gentiles rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. Verse 27, For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. Verse 30, while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Peter and John had friends that I would say are not always common. Peter and, and John's friends steered them back to God and they point out the fact Again, that God has never lost control, and that as a result, we can trust God. Make no mistake, friends like these are good friends. 
Proverbs calls them biblical friends. They're good friends. But as a group, here's what happens. Peter and John come back, and the first thing that they do is they pray. This is only the second time in the book of Acts that we see that the whole group together, collectively, corporately, spends time in prayer. The first time was in Acts chapter 1, whenever they're saying, we need to replace Judas, and so we pray, and then they, they, they casted lots to find the next apostle, and, and that was one of our first messages. But here, they're, they're spending time, and they pray. You see, when we spend time and we pray, it reminds us that we're dependent upon God. It reminds us when we pray that we don't have all of the wisdom and the answers, but that God does. I'll say it's interesting that as they spend time and pray, God exposes to them or puts it on their hearts two verses from Psalm 1 and 2. Psalm 2, verse 1 and 2. Psalm 2, verse 1 and 2. I'll get it in a minute. But he puts that on their hearts. And how often does that happen for us when we spend time and we pray? God seems to put on our hearts scripture. But there is value to stopping and to taking time and to pray. In fact, just a, a little fun fact, because I like to incorporate these at times. The Apostles' Creed talks about how Jesus Christ was crucified under Pontius Pilate. There's actually a reason for that. Because there is historical significance. You see, if we just taught that Jesus died and there was no point in history that was attached to his death, all of a sudden, after a, a few thousand years, it could become a nebulous concept to us. But Jesus died at a specific point, at a specific time in history, obviously all under God's sovereign plan that it would happen under the rule of Pontius Pilate. But the point is this, that Jesus died, and we can nail that to a time in history but that means that we also come under the authority of Scripture. You see, when we pray and God gives us a word from his word or some Scripture, how we come under that authority is so important. What if, what if Peter and John's friends, what if they would have said, how could this happen? How could God allow this to happen in your life? What if they would have taken them down that road? What if that would have happened? I think about some of these things whenever I'm preparing a text. And, and here's what I, I come up with, with kind of an easy answer, but it's just where, I, where I've settled. What if that would have happened? Then they would have missed out on what God was doing. They would have missed out on the opportunity to embrace what it means to surrender to God and then be used in a powerful way. They would have missed out on that. But instead, we see the example of what it means to live for Jesus, even when it comes at our own personal discomfort. In fact, we see the disciples, I don't know if I can say that they're truly praising God for the circumstances, but what I can tell you is there seems to be an excitement. We see that in verse 29. It, it says this, uh, that they were praying for courage. They were praying for more courage and more boldness. They've already lived with courage as they faced the Sanhedrin, the religious council at that time, they faced them with courage. And yet they're praying for more courage. They're saying, God, we, we want this boldness. We're not praying that you would ease the discomfort. We're not praying, God, that you would make our lives easier. Just the opposite. We're praying, God, that you'd give us greater boldness so that we can share the message of Jesus Christ with people. I think about how sometimes we as a church, we pray for boldness. Maybe we pray for confidence or discernment or wisdom. But what about this? In verse 30, it says, we're going to pray for, for boldness. But we're asking you, God, also that you would stretch out your hand to heal. And signs and wonders would be done. What would it look like if we asked God to give us the courage, but also that he would work in miraculous ways? That there would be signs and wonders that would be done in order for people, again, to be drawn closer to God. That's one of my favorite parts of the story where they heal the lame man is because Peter and John weren't given praise. It says all of the people were praising God. So instead of asking for it to be easier, they pray for wisdom and boldness. Or they, pray, they pray for courage. Imagine living this type of life of surrender to God. This is what... He asks for. That's why it says the point is that surrender has a price. I don't know if any of you ever played poker. 
and maybe this is not the right time to bring up this illustration in church, but I, play, I played a lot of poker back in college, and I'm not going to tell you how good I, I was, um, because any poker player who says that probably wasn't that good. But what I can tell you is, is I loved playing poker. We would play Texas Hold'em, and I know there's a lot of different ways to play poker, but one of the things that happens in poker eventually is, is you start to run out of chips. And, and when you start to run out of chips, you look for the right hand in order to go all in on it. You, you try to pick something good. You know, like maybe, maybe queens or, or kings or ace-king suited together, but you don't pick a two and a seven offsuit or something bad like that. And, and if you've never played poker, you don't realize that that's like the worst hand you could be dealt. But you pick a good hand. And whenever you go all in, you, you take the risk of either doubling up and then you get to keep playing or you face the fate of now you're out of the game, you've run out of money. But in every game of poker, there are multiple times where, where people at the table have to go all in. And they go all in and either, again, double up or, or they're done. But here's what I think of with this illustration. Peter, John, and the rest of the people that were praying literally just went all in. They said, God, instead of ease and comfort and protection, we're going all in. We're living for you regardless of the cost. And that's what it means for us to surrender to him. So they went all in. And how does God respond? Verse 31 tells us. It says that when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. You see, God didn't just hear their prayer and, and, and leave it at that. He, in fact, even shook the room where they were gathered. That was significance in this moment, that God had heard their prayer and that God approved of their prayer. So they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and that led them to be able to speak the word of God with all boldness. The boldness here that we see comes from the power of the Holy Spirit. This isn't them trying to do the best that they can do on their own. Like, God, this was hard, but you know what? I'm going to do the best I can. I'm going to try it again, and I'm just going to see what I can do in my own strength. It wasn't like that at all. This is them saying, God, we can't do it, but we know that you can. So what we're going to do is we're going to surrender fully to you. This is what we're asking of you. And God heard that prayer, and he responded to that prayer by filling them with the Holy Spirit in order that they had the power of God in them to use them to share the word of God with boldness. These people went all in. And this, I know, is happening in the lives of people all around this church. You see, some of us pray for boldness, but I want to encourage you to also be praying that God would do miraculous things. Maybe, that's, maybe a miraculous thing is that somebody is physically healed from a, a condition that they're experiencing physically. Maybe a miraculous thing would be that God would bring unity in your family. Maybe a miraculous thing is that you would be able to give up the anger, the bitterness, the, the unforgiveness that you've held on to. Those would be miracles. Those would be signs and those would be wonders. But I don't want to limit whatever God might ask you to be praying for. But I'm saying this, pray for those opportunities as well because God is at work. Just the other day, I was down in the cafe, and if you haven't had a chance to, to visit the cafe, I want to encourage you to do that at some point. It's, it's open at 8 in the morning, closes for the service times, runs till 1245. It's an awesome opportunity to grab a cup of coffee. But as I was in the cafe, I made my way down to the kids' cafe, and, which is just you know further down. And again, it's because I'm looking at potential suitors for husbands for my daughters. And <laughs> I know some of you think that's weird, and others of you are like, yeah, we're doing the same thing, so it's not weird. And and others, others are sitting there thinking, I don't know if this is the church for us anymore. And <laughs> I just want to say that while I was down there, there were some dads playing with some of the toys. And so if you want to shame anyone, don't shame me, shame them. But, but while I was down there, I happened to, to run into a, a mom. And she goes, Jed, I have to tell you about a story. And I said, all right, I'd love to hear it. She goes, this last week I happened to be on a, on a trip traveling for work. And while I was traveling, I was speaking. I was like, whoa, you were speaking? That's really cool. And she goes, yeah, I was speaking. And, and one of the things that had come up was the question, why are you living so different or what makes you so different? 
And she goes, in that moment, she's with all of these other professionals. In that very moment, she's like, I knew I needed to share it's because of my faith in Jesus Christ. And she did. That type of surrender comes with a price. The price of what will my peers think of me? What will these other professionals think of me? As a result of her sharing her testimony of Jesus, later that day she was at a table and one of the other ladies next to her said, here's some stuff going on in my life. And, and she shared it. And the, the person from our church was able to pray with that person. And I say, that, that's powerful. That's the type of boldness that we continue to hear God doing through you. But that comes with the price, the price of surrender. The next point is this, unity comes with a cost. Unity comes with a cost. You may be sitting here this morning saying, how much is this Jesus gonna cost me? So there's a price to surrender, there's a cost for unity. Well, let me first say this. You know how you can pick your friends, but you can't pick your family? Sometimes unity is really difficult. The other night I was sitting at the, the dinner table. It might have been Sunday night or, or Monday night. There's only a few nights in the week where we get to do our family uh, Bible time together because of other schedules. And you know what I'm talking about if you have kids and they're involved in anything. So, so we were sitting at the table. And uh, we sometimes talk about, the, we, we read through the verses, I mean, rather from Psalms. And sometimes if it's long, we, we cheat and listen on you version and follow along. And sometimes that's a fight, so there's unity that, that needs to be had there. But while we were having that time together, we finished our Bible reading, and my daughters began to talk about how, how difficult life is having long hair. And I'm just listening to them. And one of the things that you need to know is in my home, I don't, my home, yeah, that felt good to say. That's what my wife always says. I normally say our home, but that felt really good. Now I know why she does that. But in, in my home, I don't always get to, to talk without interruptions. That's just the reality of having three daughters and a wife, right? But on Sunday mornings, I get to talk for 30 minutes <laughs> with no interruptions. It's, it's amazing. But back to the dinner table, they're, they're talking about the difficulty of that. And I looked over, and I was feeling a little bit bad for myself, you know, because they have hair. And I said, girls, if you think that's difficult... You, you should experience what life's like when you're losing your hair. And my daughter, my older one, she looks at me and she goes, that's not a widow's peak. That's like the golden arch. <laughs> and then she whispers, and I'm loving it. <laughs> and I, I'm here to say, I know where she got that. And it's from my father-in-law. That, that type of humor is all him, not, not me. But anyways, unity comes with a cost. Even if it's with your family, even if it's with your church, even if it's with your friends. But when we follow Christ, that's what he desires from us. You see, we're on a, a path of really looking at what does God's word say? What does God's word say? And when we study God's word, we know that the goal is to glorify God. I know that's a churchy word, but basically it means we follow God. We follow God at all costs. And as we study his word and as we follow him at all costs, we see how he wants to bring us together. Earlier this year, I talked about how when we go through this book, the book of Acts, it is not going to be a time where we just go through it. It's going to be a time where the word of God goes through us and it changes us individually. It changes us in the context of, of friends or family or, or small groups. It changes us as a group, as a church family together because as we look at God, he brings us together. That's the same reason that we often say, pray with your spouse. Because when you pray with your spouse, God has a way of bringing you together. We say pray with your family or your small group or, or with friends in the church because as you pray, God has a way of bringing us together. That's what it means to be united or brought together. And as that happens, each of us continue to be challenged, right? We're challenged with not only with what God's word says, but how do we live a life of surrender? Jesus prayed in the garden, Father, help them be one as we are one. Exactly why the devil tries to erode away at the unity. 
But unity comes at a cost, and it did for these early Christians as well. Don't think for a moment, don't think for a moment that these early Christians didn't have their own customs, their own clothing styles, their, their own way of living that they had to surrender. In verse 32, it says this, Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart. And no one said that, his, no one said, uh, that the things that belonged to him was his own but they had everything in common. Verse 33, and with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them. For as many as were owners of lands or houses, they sold them and they brought the proceeds of what was sold. They laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. Thus Joseph who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. He was a Levite, a native of Cyprus. He sold a field that belonged to him, and he brought the money, and he laid it at the apostles' feet. You see, the cost of unity isn't just for one. The cost of unity is for all of us. It isn't just some saying, God, I'm going to totally surrender to you. It's, it's everybody saying, God, we're going to totally surrender to you and trust you. And that's what leads us to verse 32, where we read that those who believed were of one heart and one soul. You see, when we trust God enough with our lives, with our possessions, with, with our preferences, God has a way of bringing us together, and it leads us to sacrificial living, sacrificial giving. But it isn't just about the money. It isn't just about uh, possessions or, or lands or homes like we see in the text. It's about everything. It's about God bringing us together for his good purpose and for his plan. In this time, this type of unity allowed them, it says in verse 33, to testify of the resurrection of Jesus. You see, this power of the Holy Spirit bringing them together gave them a testimony. It gave them the right to share with others about how Jesus was changing them. People aren't interested in hearing about Jesus if he's not real to us. But when he continues to change us, then they ask the question, what is different about you? It's powerful. What we see here in the text was the greatest and most profound, it was the most satisfying unity that the world had seen up to this point. Now, unfortunately, next week it all gets ruined, but we'll cover that next week. But in this situation... It isn't that everybody was the same. That's the beauty of it. They were all different. Remember, God was bringing people together from all different parts of the world, and as he brought them together, they continued to surrender. So it isn't about them being the same. It's about that they were different, and God brought them together. And this generosity, this great unity led to a testimony, and there was care for one another. This is not a, a type of, uh, of communism. Communism says what's yours is everyone, everyone's. Christianity says what's mine is yours. There's, there's giving to glorify God. It's very different. Right? Communism, again, is what's yours is everyone's, and Christianity says what's mine is yours. I'm not being political. I'm, I'm sharing with you a distinction from sometimes what we hear. But there was not a needy person in the group. You see, these believers, they valued what God said. They valued what God called them to do, more than possessions. They valued what God was leading them to do more than preferences. We all have possessions. We all have preferences. But as God brings people together, our preferences, our possessions, are, are going to be challenged. So how do we handle that? I was talking with uh, Trenton at one point, kind of working through the sermon, and he goes, Jed, here's a question. Do you have possessions? Do you have preferences? Or do they have you? And I was like, that's good. I might, I might share that. So I shared that. Do they have you or do you have them? Luke uses an extraordinary example of Barnabas selling land and giving it all to the apostles. You know what I love about this situation? This is an extraordinary example. I realize that, and I'm not saying that you need to do that. But what I love about this illustration is we have no idea how much land was sold. We don't. It could have been one acre, quarter acre, could have been a thousand acres. We have no idea how much land was sold. We have no idea how much money he received. We don't. 
But whatever it was, he laid it at the feet of the apostles in order for them to use it for the needs of everybody. What we see in the story isn't the amount. What we see is the heart behind a person that God was going to continue to use through the book of Acts. See, Barnabas was somebody who was trying to live for Jesus. That's, that's the title of the text, or the title of the message, Live for Jesus. Barnabas wanted to live for Jesus, which required for him to love like Jesus. It required him to love like Jesus. But the early church is not able to get to this place of unity. They can't get to this place of unity until they first surrender their hearts and lives to God. You see, we didn't get to this place until we first got to the place where John and Peter said, God, it's, it's not my will, it's yours. And then they go to their friends, and as they're with their friends, their friends say the same thing. God, it's about you. This is, a, this is for you, it's about you, and we want to serve you. That all happened before these, I'll say, miraculous opportunities to serve and care for one another occurred. There was an individual surrender of who they were and what they had before they were able to use it to bring people together. They didn't get there overnight. But they got there through the power of God. You see, when we live for Jesus, we have the amazing privilege of being used in powerful ways to share the love of Christ with others. But it begins with an individual decision. You might be here this morning and you might say, I, I've, I've heard of Jesus. I've heard Jesus talked about and I've heard him taught. But I don't know if I've really ever surrendered to him. I don't know if I've really ever surrendered my heart and my life to him. And in the quietness of, of your seat, I'm going to I'm going to pray in just a moment. And if you've never done that, you can pray with me. But you might also be here this morning, and you might say, that's where I began, however many years ago. But I've gone a long way from that. And I need to re-surrender my heart, my life, my passions, my will, my preferences to God this morning. And if that's you, I'm going to pray for us too. But as a church, let's pray together this morning.